end of class, I'll talk a bit about what next class is going to look like and everything like that. But for now, um, <clears throat> jumping right back in where we were, we are going to pick up where we left off on the prototype theory of concepts. So as we said last time, according to the prototype theory, um, what a concept is, is not a set of necessary and sufficient conditions like a definition in the classical view. It's rather a bunch of characteristics that are commonly associated with something. So the prototype of bird, our concept of bird will include things like flies and chirps and lays eggs and all those sorts of things. And we said the advantages of this sort of theory of concepts were that it allowed us to account for these typicality judgments, such as why is it that somebody says that a robin is a more typical or better instance of a bird. Another one is it explains the fuzziness of our judgments, why we uh, say that a carpet is kind of furniture, but kind of not. It explains why we're able to say that, oh yes, that is a game even if we don't have a clear definition of a game. So we talked last time about what some of the positives were. Um, all of this sound familiar? We doing all right with all this stuff? Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so what I want to do now is just run through some of the issues with the prototype theory. Some of the things that come up, um, some of these are gonna sound familiar in comparison to the classical theory but others are going to be new problems. But does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, feelings about prototypes, anything we talked about last time, anything that came up for you? Or should I jump into what the issues are? All right, so those typicality judgments, how did we say they work? What was a typicality judgment? It was the idea that, you know, we all know what a fruit is, and yet we're all willing to say that an apple is more of a fruit or a fruitier fruit in some way than like an olive is. So the idea was that these typicality judgments were supposed to be proof that um, our, our concepts are these sorts of prototypes because it's the fact that they're a prototype that is explaining the typicality judgment. So the idea is that if our concept fruit, has a bunch of things under it, like, I don't know, what are fruit characteristics? Sweet, grows on trees. Uh, seeds. Seeds, that's a good one. Seeds makes juice, etc. And so if this is what our concept is, this list of conditions that is not necessary, but that an ideal or prototypical fruit has, we explain why some types of fruits are more easily identified with fruits than others or more fruitier. So for instance, the idea is that, you know, an apple fits more of these characteristics. It's got seeds, it grows on trees. A raspberry has no real seeds. You can make raspberry juice, but you don't do it as often. It's sweet and it grows on a bush, not a tree. So it's less fruit-like. And an olive doesn't fit like any of them. So it's very low on the scale. So that's supposed to explain the typicality judgments. That's the account of it. Now, if this is right, there should be some concepts that we don't get typicality judgments for because there's a handful of concepts that it seems like there isn't gonna be a prototype because rather these are the handful of concepts that we do have clear definitions for. We've talked about some of them already. What are the exceptional concepts that we have very nice, straightforward, clear definitions of? What domain or what, what department in school might you find these types of concepts, Marie? Math. Yeah, um, math. So we've got things like math, like. There's just a definition of what an even number is. What's the definition of an even number? Divisible by two. What's the definition of a triangle? I need a sip of water so somebody else can define triangle. Um, or just do it in your head. Three sides, 2D. Yep, 2D, three sides, that's it. Uh, so what we find is in these cases, we shouldn't expect any typicality judgments because everybody knows that to be an even number is just to be divisible by two. However, 
what has been found in the lab? What is the actual evidence that's been found when you ask people, here's an even number, how typical is this of even numbers? People are more likely to say like eight is an even number over yeah. like 34. Yeah, people are going to say, no, no, eight is a much better even number than 56. Or eight is a more typical even number. And just like with the typicality judgments, it's not just that people say this. They're also quicker to recognize that eight is an even number than that 2,746,000 is an even number. Um, they're also going to uh, make fewer mistakes with the smaller numbers, the ones that are more typical. And the same thing with triangles. If you ask somebody which is a more typical triangle, this or people generally say, well, that's a terrible triangle. But if it were actually triangle shaped and where I were actually a computer who could draw, like people will generally say this is more triangle like or more a more typical triangle than that. Well, this is a problem for the prototype theory. Why is this a problem? Well, because the prototype theory is saying that the reason we get the typicality judgments comes from the structure of the concepts themselves. So that means the only place we should see them are in the concepts that don't have clear cut definitions. And yet, when we look at these other ones that we have good definitions for, we still get the same sorts of typicality judgments, which suggests wherever these judgments are coming from, they're not coming from the nature of the concepts themselves. There's something else going on here. Does the nature of that argument make sense to people? It's basically a um, lower scale in the categorization scale. So um, the idea is that, uh, Joe, I'm not sure. I, I looked. I forgot to look at my um, chat for a second, so I'm not quite sure what your uh, what your comment is on the. Oh, I'm mute. Sorry. Um, no, I was saying um, this is a problem because uh, the two of these, they all, they would get the same score on on the scale, and yet yeah. one is considered more of a triangle than the other. Yeah, exactly. If you were doing it, if our definitions were the way they really were supposed to, and if you ask people, which of these is more of, or um, what's the definition of a triangle? They'll just say three sides, three angles, and 2D. And you'll ask them something like, so can something be more or less of a triangle? And they'll go, no, 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 it's either a triangle or it isn't a triangle. And yet they still have these typicality judgments. So as Joey said, we shouldn't be expecting these typicality judgments. If, um, if our typicality judgments are actually tracking the nature of the concepts, then we shouldn't get any difference between this and this. So whatever's causing the judgment difference is not the nature of the concepts, or that's how the argument goes. The argument is supposed to go, we have these judgments in places we shouldn't, which suggests that whatever the judgments are tracking, they're not tracking the structure of our concepts. They're tracking something else. Now, of course, this raises an obvious question, which is what? If they're not tracking this, what's the, a question that's going to come up? What is it tracking? Yeah, where the hell is it coming from? What is it tracking? And at this point, this is like one of the, the major questions of just like, nobody quite has an answer to this. And one of the things is that um, prototype theorists at this point have tried to kind of, because the prototype theory gives some explanation of this, well, if you get rid of the prototype theory, you have no explanation. People have tended to hang on to the prototype theory, despite this sort of issue, and find other ways of explaining it or try to keep this. And what I want to talk about at the end of class, after we've talked about all the worries, is this idea of a dual theory that some people have come up with which is combining a prototype theory with a different theory to try to get more of an account. But that's the first thing, like that's the first issue that comes up is we have these typicality judgments, but according to those who don't like the prototype theory, well, it's not tracking what they say it is. Again, we'll come back to whether that's right or not. But any questions on this first issue? Are we doing all right? Is that the nature of the argument? All right. So that brings us back to ignorance. This ignorance worry should look familiar. Um, why? Well, it's the same ignorance worry that applied in the case of the classical theory. So um, 
because I'm tired of hearing my own voice, uh, anyone want to try or as a group to try to reconstruct what the ignorance worry was? This was the thing that had to do with smallpox and measles. Anyone remember how the worry worked? Isn't it, even though we have some sort of concept for it, we don't really know what it is? Yeah, the idea is that it seems like we have concepts. And one of the things these concepts are supposed to do is allow us to have thoughts about things in the world. So my, why do I get to have thoughts about smallpox? Well, because I have a smallpox concept. And by activating that concept, I have thoughts about smallpox. The problem is, it seems like if we actually look at what's contained in my smallpox concept, if we say it's a definition, well, what I know about a com smallpox isn't gonna differentiate it from every other disease out there that involves like discomfort and maybe death and small little pustules on the body. Um, so the issue is we don't know enough about smallpox to have a definition that would allow us to have thoughts that separate thoughts from our, of smallpox from thoughts of measles. So that's how the worry worked in the classical view is that we're supposed, our concepts are supposed to explain why we're able to have thoughts about things in the world. It's almost like we, our thoughts pick out the things in the world because the concepts that are, or the um, properties that are represented in our head correspond to things out in the world. But the issue is in many of these cases, we don't know enough to pick out particular things as opposed to something else. All I know about smallpox is, I don't know, a disease and measles, I don't know a disease. Well, the issue carries over the same way with the prototypes theory. So according to the classical theory, it was supposed to be a definition, but now smallpox, what, what would a prototype theory say our concept of smallpox consists of? What is it, what properties go with that? What are the characteristic features of our prototype of smallpox? Disease, sickness. Yeah, it's going to be sickness. Symptom. Um, doctor. Ock. <laughs> fever. Well, once again, we have an issue of this isn't going to be a prototype that picks apart um, smallpox from most of the other diseases we have. So in the same way that we, we have the exact same problem being carried over again, because once again, we're trying to say that what allows our concept to be about something in the world is because the thing out in the world satisfies enough of the properties that are like represented as defining that concept as to differentiate my thoughts. So like, you know, why isn't my thought of a computer a, type, a thought about a fruit? Well, because my computers aren't sweet, they don't grow on trees, they don't have seeds, they don't make juice, et cetera. Well, in the same way, We'd want to say then that my definition of smallpox is sickness, doctor, fever. Well, then how am I able to think smallpox isn't the same thing as measles when all I have to go off of are these very, very vague sorts of things? So the ignorance issue is, again, just that we like our thoughts. We think when we're thinking about things in the world, it is a precise, accurate thought. Like when I'm having a thought about measles, it is different than my thought about smallpox. But the issue here is it looks like we don't know enough about measles or smallpox. Yeah, it's like there, there's presumably some unique characteristics, but I don't know what they are. And if my knowledge of the unique characteristics is supposed to be my basis for having thoughts about those things, the fact that I don't know those unique characteristics means that in some sense, I can't have thoughts that differentiate smallpox from measles. And yet most of us want to say, when I tell you my great grandpa died of smallpox, I'm not accidentally saying my great grandpa died of measles. I, in some sense, know the difference. And it looks like this account here isn't explaining what the difference is in enough way. Um, uh, I have a question. Marie. Yeah. Couldn't you say like the reason why you know that smallpox and measles are not the same thing is because they have different terminology. So like, it's not like um, most diseases have like two names. Or mm -hmm. So here's, uh, I think this is a great idea. And this is one that a lot of people try to go with where um, you wanna say that it's something about like the name that's tied in with it. The issue is 
that sometimes um, you want to be able to, well, there's a couple different worries here. And if anyone wants to jump in, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate here because I don't think there's anything, um, I don't think there's anything knocked down to say in response to that, Marie. But I do think like the sorts of arguments that some people give are things along the lines of um, sometimes it looks like we have different concepts and in some sense we know they're different concepts even if we have a single word that picks out them both. So for instance, um, I don't know, hepatitis. I think there are different types of hepatitis but I don't know what they are. Um, so you might want to argue that in this case when you're having a thought about one type of hepatitis it's not the same as a thought about the other type, even if you have the same word for it. Now, I'm not sure if that's fully satisfying of a response, but that's one thing people have said. Another, I think, is actually the uh, the worry you you talked about a couple times ago of just like language itself being different for different languages. So if we're tracking too closely on um, on the words themselves, we might have trouble when we get into a language that uses different words. So for instance, if you've got a language that just calls all feverish diseases fever, then do we want to, but like somebody thinks of them as different, like you, you know that the fever that causes people to die is a different fever from the one that just makes them mildly sick, but you just call it all fever then you might, again, have that sort of worry. Now, I, to be clear, I don't think that's the end of the story. I think somebody could then jump on this and push back. But I think that is generally the way that people, people get a little worried about language because of the cultural differences and because of the, the words not perfectly always matching on to what they refer to. Any other questions, comments, concerns on the ignorance one? I have a I have a question and comment. I don't know if it's about the ignorance. I just in general about the two. Um, I, I feel like you know when I'm listening to this, it makes me think about like I guess a lot of concepts can't represent things that we don't like the ever evolving world, like mm -hmm. technology. Like technology didn't exist, let's say, however many years ago, we didn't have a concept or a representation for that in our mind prior to that. So how does either of them account for that? Like, So here is generally the way that these things are accounted for. And the way that they've generally been accounted for, well, actually, yeah, the way that either of these accounts generally go is until the computer was invented, we didn't have a computer concept. So what the person who invented the computer, though, what they did is they took their concepts they already had lower level, simpler concepts and combined them together to create a new concept. So maybe they had like a concept of calculation and they had a concept of machine and they had a concept automatic. And what they did, um, either the prototype or the classical view, what they did, this person who invented the computer is they smushed these things together and came up with a new concept, which had these parts together. And this right here is now our computer concept. Then what happens is this computer concept, when other people learn this concept, what they do is they put together these simpler parts or what they do is they come into contact with a bunch of computers. And by doing that, they then identify what are the common prototypical features of computers. So the idea would be that what you do is you take the knowledge you already have or the things you already know, combine them together to create a new concept. And then that new concept can then guide your behaviors in the creating of this new computer. Or it can be the sort of thing where now new people can learn this concept by coming into contact with the object that you've created. So it's just going to be building up from a simpler version to a more complicated version. Now, I think there are a lot of worries about this, of things like we talked about a few times ago, which is like, it has to, it has to, uh, it can't go on forever. It can't be all the way down to the bottom. There has to be some simplest concepts. And then you have a question of where did those come from and what are they? Another worry you might have is um, things along the line of, give me one second to think of another worry. 
But I guess I feel because it like kind of still overlaps with the ignorance thing because it's there's an ever evolving world. So like there was never a COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was SARS, there was coronavirus, but there wasn't this genome that we are supposedly infected with now. So how do they account for an ever evolving world in prototype or um, classical theory? So the ideal would, on either the prototype or classical view, what they'd have to say is that there's something about your concept of COVID-19 that allows you to distinguish it from other viruses or other sorts of things. So maybe in your prototype of COVID-19, so a classical view would say something maybe like built into your idea is caused a pandemic in 2020. Um, so that gets built in. So when you're building the COVID-19 concept, and you can think of it, at first we weren't able to think about COVID as different from other sorts of, uh, we weren't really able at first, why, why did COVID get off the ground? We couldn't really think of it as separate than other diseases. It's only once it started going that people were really able to think like, this is a different beast than things that have been around recently. And so the idea would be um, that you would have to say that there's something about your thought that differentiates COVID-19. Now, I think what you're pointing to though is like the core issue of if you recognize the ignorance worry, then really they don't have a response to this changing world phenomenon. It's, you'd have to say that there's something that differentiates it, but there isn't enough there. So as a matter of fact, um, one thing that people in general, and we, we're not gonna have time this semester to talk about it much, but very often what people try to do is say that the content of the concept is not just determined by what's inside, but is somehow dependent on your causal relations with the outer world. So it's not that your concept of COVID has all the COVID properties. It's rather that the fact that you have something in your head was caused by the actual COVID-19 little virus. Now, how you cash that out and how you can say that like, there, this like weird metaphysical relation in which you're being in response to actual COVID makes your thoughts different than being in response to say like SARS or the flu. So there's a lot of tricky questions here, but what you're pointing, putting your finger on here, Grace, is that if you go with the, um, with the either the classical or prototype view, you have to say that the way people respond to, the only way people can respond to an ever-changing world is by just combining smaller concepts they all already have. And they're, you're just assuming, like they're just saying, and matter of fact, we are able to get every thought we have today out of those smaller concepts. But I think there's a genuine worry here that you're pointing to, which is that's not necessarily obviously true. Like it could be the case that if we want to explain how we interact with new things and have thoughts about things which have never existed before, we need to bring in other considerations, like what have we interacted with? Um, who have we talked to? And that sort of stuff. Was that re um, responsive to your question? I think so. Okay. I think so. I have to think about it. But yeah. it's just, I feel like, like both of the theories just don't account for the varieties in the evolving world because they're just so kind of definitive even though prototype is not supposed to be definitive, they both have clear definitions. Yeah, they have a set of things that you have to- or Requirements, that right? There. Another thing that um, somebody might say on this account is to kind of go back to uh, the point that Marie and Holland had a couple of classes ago, you could say that maybe there's some type of mismatch here. And as a matter of fact, maybe there are some things in the external world that are just beyond our ability to think them properly because we lack the conceptual accounts. Um, so for instance, like how many of you have ever tried to understand string theory in physics? Um, I've, I've read like one sentence on it and then my head hurt too much. String theory claims something like there are four dimensions of time and 12 dimensions of space. I can't even wrap my head around what that could possibly mean. 
So you might say that in that sort of case, maybe there are things out in the world that I can't think because my concepts are just unable to grasp that. Like my concepts assume there's three dimensions of space, not 12. And so maybe a, a um, prototype theorist might say, well, there's some things you're talking about where uh, the ever-changing world, we just project a certain sort of, um, a certain type of, Alan, I'll come back to you in one second. We project an order on what's actually a disordered world. So when we're actually thinking about it, we do have a tendency to group things up into nice clean cut things, even if in reality, the world is very blurry. So maybe what we say in this sort of case is, all right, yeah, you're right. Our concepts can't account for an ever changing world. But if we actually look at how we think, that's okay because we often aren't able to interact with this. Alan asks, and this is a um, famous thought experiment of, um, can you think of a new, like what a new color would be? And an idea of um, why can't you think of a new color? And part of the reason why you would say that is that, yeah, you have conceptual limitations. Like I can't imagine what ultraviolet would be. Um, there's also a perceptual element, which we'll be coming to in a, a few weeks time, or a, a few classes time. Um, any other, these are great questions, by the way. I love it when you all bring up these things. They really, I think sometimes when you're the one talking about the stuff, you don't realize which parts would be helpful to dwell on a little more until somebody asks a question. So these are all very excellent questions you're all asking. Any other questions on this? All right, in that case, I'm gonna erase these first two and talk about the last two worries. So the missing prototypes worry is uh, simply put that there are missing prototypes. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, if the prototype theory is right and what our concept is for, for every concept we have is a prototype, then we shouldn't be able to think of concepts that don't have prototypes. We shouldn't be able to think of things that uh, we can't think of what the prototype is like. And the argument goes that if we actually look at examples, what we find is there are many concepts that we seem able to think, and yet we don't have a prototype associated with it. And if we don't have a prototype associated with it and the prototype is supposed to be what the concept is that suggests that, well, if we have a concept, but no prototype, then our concept can't just be a prototype. So the sorts of examples that uh, people come up with are, um, let me just pull up the reading because it's better to just get some that other people have said. So if they're bad examples, it's not my fault. Uh, Thirty first century invention not a dog. J Z's great 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 grandma. So, are we able to have thoughts about these things? Can you think of what a 31st century invention might be? As in like the year 3000. Um, yeah, flying car or something along those lines. What about your concept not a dog? Like what you, we can think about not a dog. We know some things about not a dogs. They're not dogs. Um, we know that's true because it's in the definition. What about Jay-Z's great, great, great grandma? Um, we can say things about it, her, like Jay-Z's great, great, great grandma was not the same person as Jay-Z's great, great, great grandfather. So we're able to think about these things and we're able to categorize it. Like we can use this to say, this is not Jay-Z's great, great, great grandma. This is not, not a dog. Well, this actually is a not a dog. 
This is, if I were to pick up a dog, it would be not a not a dog. So the idea is that it looks like we're able to have thoughts about these things. And if this is right, and our thoughts are built on concepts, then there should be, in some sense, concepts for each of these things. And yet, give me a prototype of what not a dog looks like. What is a not a dog, like the prototypical not a dog? Well, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one prototypical not a dog. Here's another prototypical, not like it doesn't seem like there's a prototype for this or Jay-Z's great, great, great grandma. Again, doesn't seem like there's a prototype. So the argument goes, if we actually look at human thinking, if concepts are supposed to be what grounds our thought, and we have a lot of things that we seem to have concepts for because we can have thoughts about them, um, but there's no prototype that goes with it, the concept must be something other than a prototype. That's how the argument goes. Now, I'm going to put my cards on the table and say I'm not entirely convinced by this argument. Um, for a couple different reasons, but if anyone has any questions about this or has some concerns of their own, bring them up, uh, feel free to bring them up now. What are some worries around these cases? I feel like it's just kind of like going backwards. Instead of building forward, you're kind of breaking it down. So here's, here's one thing that strikes me is like, there's something that feels incredibly artificial about these in a way that like you're, instead of just starting with like a complete whole, you're like breaking them down into weird parts, sticking them together. Like, um, like there's something like the dog in some sense, and this is just a lot of intuition, gut check stuff, but like, it feels to me like I have a concept, not a, a concept dog, which is stored in my head and I use and have used since I was a child, it feels somewhat artificial to say there's something equivalent, not a dog, that's also stored in my head. Or I have an idea of um, what an invention is like, like I have a prototypical invention, like that seems like maybe something I would have a concept for, but is it really the case that it's the same sort of thing, this concept 31st century invention? Or like I have a Jay-Z concept, I have a great, great, great grandmother concept, maybe even not that, I have a grandma concept, or I have a mother concept, but there seems something very artificial about these sorts of things. Um, does anyone else share this kind of gut intuition feeling with me that there's just something, there's some important difference here between the prototypes that seem to be missing and a lot of the cases of concepts that seem to have prototypes attached to them. Like there's something more primary or core about bird than not a dog. Does anyone else share this or am I alone having this tough feeling? It just seems like if we're thinking of the building blocks of thought, then bird feels like a building block. Not a dog doesn't feel like the same sort of building block. Yeah, I feel like not a dog has like many different representations. So it's not an equivalent of like one concept. It's like many concepts. Yeah, it seems like there's there's just something weird about it where it just feels like, yeah, it's not a building, but it's a this corresponds to a lot of different concepts. Um now there is, so if you share this feeling with me that there's something weird about these concepts that somehow set them apart from the more primary ones. There is still a problem. Um, there is going to still be an issue that this worry points to, which is it does become very difficult to draw the line here. Like, why do we get to say that dog is a primary concept or bird is a primary concept or left as opposed to right is a primary concept, but we don't get to say Jay-Z's great-great-grandmother is? What about like, if we get rid of this, do we get to say great grandmother is a primary concept? Like, where do you draw the line? If we're supposed to be understanding like how the human mind works and what the building blocks are like, it does seem like we start to have a problem of, well, we, we can't just arbitrarily decide to throw out certain concepts as artificial and others as not artificial. Um, one way people might want to go is using the language. So you'd say like, if there's one word for it, then it's a primary concept. If there's not one word for it, it's a complex concept that's just like built on the fly, doesn't count. 
But that goes back to the same worry Marie had two classes ago of, well, what do you do with a language where there's one word for both dogs and wolves? Like, what do we do there? Um, so does everyone understand, though, that got a little bit me just like staring up at the sky and uh, having concerns of my own. So I just want to make sure that I'm not just like rambling to myself here. Grace? I feel like the not a dog thing makes me exactly think about what Marie is saying about language because like we're defining what the representation of what a dog is by what we call a dog, you know? So I, I don't know, like, I guess it, like then language, I feel like what she was saying goes so much back into like representation, you know, like building blocks in our mind, but then we, we pair it with language. And here's another worry about that, just to, to jump on this, which is there's this strange issue where um, we where with language, like there's a sense in which what becomes a dog is what we put the word dog on. Like that, to be a dog is just the thing that we put dog on. But there is this other worry of then, well, where did dog get its meaning? Or how do we know what to put dog on? So there's this weird little circle thing in which very often people say like to learn the meaning of a word is to learn what concept goes with it. So like what gives dog its meaning is our dog concept. But what now counts as the dog concept? There is this worry of like, well, if we lean too heavily on the language, then the definition of dog concept is the very thing which uh, just is picked out by the word dog and we just round and round we go with no explanation. Yeah, it just becomes like a vicious cycle. Yeah, just a, yeah, and we have no explanatory power left. So the, the thing I want, like if there's one takeaway with this missing prototypes issue, it's really that there is something to be said of there are things we think that do not have prototypes attached to them. There, therefore, this is something that a prototype theorist has some problem explaining. Like, why can we, if the, the contents of our thoughts are our concepts, then how is it that we can have concepts that don't have prototypes attached? One thing you can say is this is a problem for the prototype theorist. Another thing you can say if you are, if you like the prototype theory is, well, we have prototypes for the core concepts, things like, you know, height or size or uh, dog. But the more complex ones have to be built on the fly in the moment. If you accept that route, though, you do pick up other problems like, well, uh, where do you draw the line? Does rainbow count as one or as two? Is that one object? What about grandmother? Is that just mother combined with another concept? Where do you draw, like, where do you bottom out? I don't think there's a good answer to this question. I think it's a very open-ended thing. I just wanted to highlight the worry with it. Um, any others on this before I cover the last one? Great. I just want to say this makes me think of like cognitive cognitive dissonance, like where you have two things in your mind. You know what it, but you know, yep. you have two things in your mind fighting with each other, and it kind of makes me think of this and the concepts. Does that make sense? So in in some, I'm not sure if I'm totally grasping what you're pointing to. I think but I'm still trying to form why. <laughs> I'm wondering if talking about the dual stuff later on at the very end of class, because basically what the dual theory says in this sort of case is just, let's take the good stuff of prototype theory and let's take the good stuff of the classical theory and just smush them together. And then what can happen is you have cases in which you literally have two competing concepts. And what is going on in our thought is just like in a cognitive dissonance case, behavior gets explained by what happens when these two competing bits get smushed together and we find something that's on the borderline that our, um, our literal definition applies to nicely, but our prototype doesn't. Why is this the case? How does that explain thought? So I'll come back to that as soon as we finish um, the compositionality. Sorry, not missing prototypes. Compositionality is the last one. Um, I'm going to try the book or the reading got into a little bit of mathematical jargon about the compositionality stuff. And I don't especially know it's nice out and I don't want to smash anyone with too much like compositional mathematical set theory jargon. So I'm just going to stick this in the most basic way possible. First off, how many people of compositional? How many people have seen this word before compositional? 
Uh, it's a good word to know. Uh, so I just, just want to define it quickly. What does it mean? Anyone know? Anyone want to give it a, a stab at defining it? Something is compositional if its nature is entirely a product of its parts and how those parts are put together. So something is compositional if its nature is entirely a product of its parts and how those parts are put together. So this is a really fancy way of basically talking about things where if you know what they're made of and how those things are arranged together, you know it's very core or what it is. And so a classical case that's like this is chemistry. Water, what is like a pure water molecule? Well, what is it? Anyone remember? Yeah, H2O. So it literally, it's shaped like this. It's two hydrogens and an oxygen. If you know what the parts are and you know what, uh, how they're arranged, you know the nature of oxygen. I mean, or I mean the nature of water. Like that is what it is to know water. Other ones are um, sentences, especially in a computer language where if uh, the meaning of an entire sentence is just the meaning of its parts and how they're arranged. So to give a, um, a simplistic example, John likes Sue. Well, if you know what type of liking they're talking about, you know who Sue is and you know who John is, and you see that the order is John likes Sue, then you know that John likes Sue, you understand the whole thing. That's all compositionality is, is that you can combine things together and understand a larger whole entirely by understanding the parts and how they're put together. Now, why compositionality comes up in this context is that thought is compositional, or at the very least, it seems compositional to a high degree, because one of the amazing things about human thought is that we're able to have thoughts and understand things that you've, you can understand something you've never thought before, and you can even come up with thoughts that nobody's ever thought of ever in human history. Anyone want to give it a stab? Somebody try to get the entire class to think of something that nobody's ever thought of before in human history. Um, I bet you you can do it if you just like put a little thought into it. Um, a whale with horns. Yeah, a whale with horns. I've never thought of a whale with horns. Um, what about like a, we could go with a full like concept of like a whale with horns bringing flowers to its date on their first date together. Like I'd be willing to bet nobody's ever thought that one. I'm just gonna take it and run. And yet you're all able to picture this whale like swimming through the ocean with like a bouquet of flowers under its little flipper. Like you're able to have this thought, why? Well, you know what flowers are, you know what whales are, you know what horns are, you know what dates are, and you know what first dates are. Like you're able to have that thought. So one of the core ideas of how we're able to think is that um, we have these concepts that can be combined together. So why is it you can think of a horned whale, you can think of horns, you, can, you have a concept horns, you have a concept whale, smush them together. You just compose them. And the meaning of horned whale is the meaning of horned with the meaning of whale. Um, yeah, a narwhal would be something with one horn. Um, so I guess a narwhal that had two horns would fit into our definition of a, a, uh, a, a, a horned whale, but yeah, goat horns. Or like, we can imagine like a whale with a monocle. That would be pretty cute. Like just like a whale, like a giant whale eye with like a, a little tiny monocle. Um, anyway, I'm now, I'm off the rails at this point. Um, so the idea is supposed to be, if we're going to explain thought, we need to explain that how these concepts get combined together and why if we're able to know what something with two horns is and why something that's a whale well what's the meaning of something that's 
got horns and is a whale, we just smush them together. You take all the horn things and all the whale things, you understand what they have in common, then you smush them together. So that's generally how we think of it, you know? You know what red means, you know what uh, fruit means. So now compose red fruit. And on the classical or definitional approach, it's very easy to explain how this works. It's just because we have necessary and sufficient conditions for being red, and we have necessary and sufficient conditions for bringing a fruit, to be a red fruit is just something that meets both sets of conditions. That's what it is. What's the worry, though, with the prototype view? Why is it that we run into issues? Well, simply put, how do you combine prototypes together? If we define, um, or at the very least, when we look at what we get when we combine the prototypes together, they don't seem to match up. So for instance, um, prototype, what are the prototype properties of pet? What are the prototypical features of a pet? An animal, not human. Non-human animal. What else? Does it hunt? Like you, you feed it? Uh -oh. You feed it. What are some more we have here? Domesticated. Um, any others anyone feels are really characteristic of pets? Ownership? Yeah, there's some sort of ownership involved. So what does our prototypical pet look like? If we're coming up with something that fits these, what do we end up with for a prototypical pet? As a matter of fact, it actually looks like you all gave more of a classical definition for pet, which is just interesting. Um, but when you think of what would the prototype for a pet be? Like if I were to draw the prototype, how would it look? Very. Yeah, it would also, it would probably be a dog or have fur or et cetera. Now, uh, what, what's the prototype, prototypical characteristic of fish? Scales. Yeah, scales. What else, what else do we have? Fins. Gills. Gills. Is gills one L or two Ls? I think I'm just gonna put, I'm gonna put six, that way I'm just guaranteed to be wrong. <laughs> um, what else do we have? Swims, I think. That's pretty prototypical. Okay. So um, water, they live in water. That is definitely a prototypical, but not necessary feature of fish. Is anyone familiar with the lungfish? It's just like weird fish that is able to survive out of water for like hours at a time and will like go like flopping along across the desert to get from like one water thing to another water thing. So like there are fish that don't fit. So this is actually a very nice. Also, there's some fish that don't have scales. Um, Anyone know what fish don't have scales? Eels. Uh, I think it depends on the type of eel. Um, but I know the ones that I know for sure don't have scales are sharks and rays. So if you've ever <laughs> a weight conscious fish, well played, Alan, well played. Um, but uh, if you've ever like rubbed uh, shark skin, it is, uh, it is quite sandpapery and not scale based. So yeah, but anyway, this is our... The blah, 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 blah. prototypical fish. Here's our prototype pet. Now, we can also, however, compose these together. We can imagine a pet fish. And what is what do we get if we get a pet fish? Well, it sure, it looks like a goldfish. It's going to look, you know, something like this, with really big goldfishy eyes. It's a front, front view of little goldfish. It's going to look like that. It's not going to look anything like what happens when you mix the prototype of fish with the prototype of pet. If we mix our prototype of fish with our prototype of pet, we'd end up with like a furry trout. And that's definitely not a goldfish. So the worry is that we need compositionality to explain how thought works. It's one of the key ideas for why human thought is productive and we're able to think things that no one's ever thought before. But if we actually think about it in the case of prototypes, it gets really difficult to understand how compositionality would work. Why is it that we can combine fish and pet 
if the only thing we have to go on are prototypes. It looks like the what you get when you combine pet and fish into pet fish, your prototypical pet fish is nothing like the prototype of fish mixing mixed with the prototype of pet. It's more complicated. Now, does that mean we couldn't do it? We couldn't come up with some complex process of how these things got mixed together? I mean, it's possible. But remember, the goal is we're supposed to be giving something that's computational, something in which a computer system could be programmed to run this and tell us how combining pet with fish gives us pet fish. Other ones, like you can imagine uh, any other sort of combination of different things that there are prototypes for, but the result is not in any way similar to what would happen if you just took the middle of the two prototypes. So does everyone understand how this works? Thought seems to work by combining things together. And it, if anything, it seems to work in the way that the classical theory gets put together. Like if we don't go with prototypes, if you just go with the defining features of fish, um, If we actually give like this part of blah, 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 animal group, then it seems like we have a very nice explanation for how we can have a uh, pet and fish. Well, if you fall into the right evolutionary grouping, such that you fall into the fish camp, and you are a non-human animal that gets fed by an owner and you're domesticated, well, then we have a ex nice explanation for what a pet fish is. It's just the middle of these two, anything that falls in both categories. If you're the prototype theorist, though, it's much more difficult to explain what's going on here. And it's the sort of thing that, like, to understand how it would work, you need to have a pretty good math degree. And um, there are, as of now, no good theories of exactly how it works. The things that I didn't necessarily need you all to read in the reading were some of the best attempts to give mathematical explanations of this. So if you want to dive into that or talk to me about it more, I just, you know, it's nice out and I don't want to subject everyone to having to talk set theory well where, um... so could it technically be simplified by classing anything as a pet if you own it and it's alive? Um, so I think the, so here's actually, that's a really great question, Raven. Um, I think one thing uh, to keep in mind with this is that the ultimate goal, we want whatever we give for our theories of concepts, we want it to track the way our thinking actually works. So if, um, so it could probably be technically simplified by saying that in your math, if you're developing a mathematical model for what's going on, you only put in the properties, you own it and it's alive. And then maybe we can combine our prototypes together better. The worry is that if we strip things down that much, to what degree are we actually giving an accurate description of the human mind instead of such a stripped down version that it's no longer actually going to give us any insight into the way the system really works. Because if you, if you take out too many complicating factors, what you end up with is uh, mathematical models that don't accurately capture the thing they're supposed to be capturing. Now, I think it's going to be a practical answer. Like it, it might be, I've never done the mathematical modeling on this. It might be that if we start with that simplified sort of definition, maybe we could give an account for how fish and pet get mixed together. But in terms of coming up with a general process in which two uh, concepts get composed together, it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to come up with simplified definitions for each and every one that could then be stuck together. Um, also like pet bird would be kind of a disaster because I feel like the prototypical pet bird looks definitely different than the prototypical bird because the prototypical pet bird I feel like is generally a parrot and it's generally owned by a pirate. But um, all right, are there any more questions on these worries? Uh, All right, so what I want to do now is just briefly talk about the dual theory. Um, because what the dual theory is, is it takes parts of the prototype theory and the definitional theory and uses it to get around some of the problems. So the prototype theory, so basically what the uh, 
one version of a dual theory, basically any theory that combines two parts is a dual theory. But this particular dual theory is going to say, So um, there's going to be a prototype element, and there's going to be a classical definition element. And we have to think about our concepts as these complex things that involve both parts. And the motivation for this view, uh, generally the way it gets spelled out, is that the prototype gets used in when we have to think fast, and the classical definition gets used when we have to uh, slow down and make sure we're right. So the idea would be our bird concept is something like a list of definitions on the one hand, but we also have this thing, which is basically just a picture of Tweety. And if somebody's asking us quickly, is this a bird? We automatically jump over and use our prototype Tweety picture. If somebody's asking us slowly, like, yeah, but explain the nature of birds, then we're going to go with a more classical definition. Um, and the advantage of going with this sort of dual approach is that some of the problems that we just raised kind of go away in this particular instance. So for instance, um, the uh, you're able to explain if you say there are two parts, you're able to explain the typicality judgments while also explaining why people are still able to say that an even number is still an even number, even if it's 2 million and 2 versus just 2. You'd say the typicality because we have a prototype of what an even number looks like, but we also have access to this other thing. Um, so that's, it, it solves the typicality worries. It also solves the... Wouldn't that also work because like we have different ways of thinking, like people argue that like there's a reptilian brain. So like, if you have that, then they're both ways could work. Okay. So I was gonna save this, but let's just jump in because you brought it up, Marie. Um, another thing is that there is a lot of evidence that human beings think in multiple levels and we have different types of brain processing. So um, there's a lot of stuff about like lower level reptilian brain things, but there's also certain sorts of uh, studies that have been done in which when we give a fast answer, it generally, like the gut feeling we go with is very often not the one that we give if we take the time to really think it out, which suggests that we, this idea that there might be two parts so it fits in with this more general idea that we have multiple thinking. So what sort of question am I talking about? Um, here's a question. I'm gonna write it down real quick. Uh, that and all cost $1.10. No, this is written terribly. Here. Does everyone have access to the chat? I'm gonna write this down in the chat so you don't have to look at it. All right, uh, it's a problem. I want you to give me the first answer that jumps in your head. I'm gonna write this out. A bat and a ball together costs $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the bat cost? What's the first answer to jump into your head? The first answer to jump into just about everybody's head is that, that the bat costs $1. What's the actual correct answer? $1.05. $1.05 is the correct answer because if a dollar if it's a dollar more than the other thing, a dollar five plus 0.5 is 110. But if this is a dollar, 
and the and we only have a dollar ten to work with. Yeah, most people get this wrong on the first time. There's lots of things like this. So the idea would be, why is it that we get this wrong so quickly? Well, when we're going fast, we have to use this messy system, and in those cases, prototypes come in handy. Um, so another, a classic one would be something like grandma. Our grandma concept would have a technical definition of mother of mother or mother of father. But then we've got another one, which is just like your stereotypical cute little old grandma picture where that lady might not, somebody who looks like that might not actually be a grandma. And somebody who looks nothing like that could be a grandma. But if I showed you a picture of like a 40 year old grandma and a cute little old lady sewing and asked you who's a grandma, you're gonna, and asked you to answer quickly, you're probably just gonna guess that little old lady. Um, and that would be another way. So not only does it explain the typicality stuff, it does fit in with some of the other evidence of how human beings think and the ways in which we do, when we're asked to think quickly, make some sloppy judgments of error. Um, another thing it helps with is uh, missing prototypes. If you're missing a prototype in those complex cases, what you can say is we do have concepts. It's just these concepts in these cases are just this complex definition because just the complex definition is the one in which, um, you know, the a 31st century invention, we don't need a prototype to have thoughts about 31st century definitions because in this case, only this one's going up. And there's also a reason that you can't have a quick thought about a 31st century, uh, a 31st century invention. You don't have a prototype to go back on. So again, it seems to fit in. So there are a lot of benefits of, and very often what you'll see, like this is just a sociological fact about how people do science, is if you've got one theory that people liked a long time, a new theory comes along that seems to be better than it, but then has problems, inevitably someone's gonna try to see what happens when you stick them together. And so this dual theory has some benefits here of sticking the two parts together. That said, the dual theory is by no means perfect. And there's a reason why this article goes on and on into things we won't be talking about this semester. But there's a reason there's like five more parts to this article. Um, and some of the issues with dual theory are, well, anyone have any thoughts of what some of the issues might be with the dual theory, given some of the other theories that we've talked about? Well, what's one of the problems that came up for both of the other ones? Fuzziness. Uh, fuzzy. So one worry you might have is we are still, as soon as you bring a classical definition element back in, we do again have an issue of, well, then why do we have this fuzziness? If every case is supposed to have a classical definition attached, then we again, we by reincorporating the classical view with the prototype view, we seem to lose our explanation of fuzziness. We had a nice one, but now we don't have a nice clear definition. Um, so that's one thing, or we have, we now have too nice of a definition. As soon as you bring classical definitions back in, things are much less messy than they should be. Um, we get ignorance again, because if we have ignorance problem over here and we have ignorance problem over here, you combine them together, the ignorance problem isn't going away. Um, anyone have any other things that pop into their head of an issue that might happen if you combine the prototype with the classical. I do think there is also a motivation of like, while yes, there's some evidence that we think in multiple ways, why motivate that these are the two ways we think in? I don't think it's a very strong objection, but I would like, like if somebody were making an argument for the duel, I want a little more as to why they think these two get stuck together in this way. Are there any more thoughts, questions, comments, concerns on this stuff? Would the conditions be a problem for the, cl the classical conditions don't meet the prototype or? I think, well, wait, what do you mean by conditions? You mean like the, the definitional features? Yeah, like the necessary and sufficient part. Yeah, so I think, I think um, we are gonna have another issue of, so similar to the fuzziness, I think also by bringing the classical definition back in, we're get again gonna run back into Plato's problem of like, why is it then that 
if we say there's a classical definition piece, why can't we give what those features are? Why can't we say what it is to be a game? Why is it that in this case, we only have a prototype to go off of? Um, so yeah, that's again going to be another worry. So it doesn't save everything, but, and so just as a matter of fact, the way that this stuff is going in the field is there is no one theory of concepts that everyone agrees on. Um, and it's actually an area, and part of the reason I wanted to talk about it is it's a very, it's still, it's been in a live area of research and discussion since the prototype theory stuff came out in the 60s and 70s, and people are still going and coming up with new theories and arguing, and just about every view still has proponents. Um, so it's just a, and, it, and it's a useful way of seeing how elements from philosophy of things like giving definitions, things like uh, this notion of family resemblance, where to be an example of a thing is just to be similar to other ones, were really mixed together with psychology in this sort of overall like area of a lot of research where the two interact quite a bit. All right, so if nobody has any more thoughts on concepts, all I want to do is just spend the last two minutes of my speaking talking about the next four classes before spring break. So, um, any more questions, comments, concerns before I just do a little business stuff? All right, so uh, we have four more. Oh, did somebody speak? Or did I just reflect off my thing? All right, so we have four classes before spring break, if I know how to count, which is a dubious claim. Um, so I'm not gonna put up the numbers. I'm just gonna put up Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. So uh, the way that, of course, I put it right in the reflection. Let me put it over here. Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. All right, so Monday, all we're going to be talking about is papers. And what this means is I just will go over the prompts, talk about the sorts of things I'm looking for, talk about some of the tips I have for writing philosophy papers. If you're a philosophy major who feels really comfortable writing papers and thinks this will be a waste of your time, um, feel free to skip. If you're somebody who's just super confident in your writing ability, feel free to skip. That said, philosophy paper writing is a bit different from other papers. So if you've never taken a philosophy class, if you're coming in through psych, um, or if you took a philosophy class four years ago, I would recommend coming along just because it can't hurt. Uh, the, the reading that's assigned, I still read it to remind myself how to write papers because sometimes you get in the weeds and you forget. I will also just go over any questions people have on the prompts, any things about sources, page numbers, all that sort of stuff. All the logistics will be talked about on Monday. We then have two days on modularity, which is basically what we'll be talking about those classes is this idea that the mind is not some undifferentiated whole, but rather it's better thought of as a similar, almost like a computer, but you have a central cognition, which is where your thinking gets done. And then you have a bunch of little tiny things, each of which corresponds to one of the senses that provides information to thinking. And each of these independently operates. And there, this has some interesting consequences. And this is kind of a, a good background thing to talk about because one, it's not quite as technical. Uh, there are scientific technical aspects to it, but it's going to be just more generally like why think that um, vision is a separate component in the mind from central cognition and what implications does that have? Uh, and it's a useful thing because many people working today assume a general something similar to this. So if you end up in uh, psychology of the more um, academic type, modularity is just a useful thing to know something about. Uh, I don't know how much time we'll be spending on this final Wednesday talking about modularity, but um, this Wednesday will be our last class before spring break. And during that class, we will maybe have stuff to talk about, but I would be surprised if we use the whole period. And then lastly, Friday, paper one due 
So officially your paper one is due the end of the day, Friday, the day before spring break. If you're totally burned out and need a little extra time, again, reach out to me. I'm willing to work on extensions on these things. Uh, if you have any concerns before that, before Monday talking about papers, feel free to reach out to me. Um, all right, that's all I need to say today. Does anyone have any questions that they want to bring up now? Uh, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so uh, that Monday, you're going to give us like in sort of like an outline of like basically show us the structure of the essay or what you expect of us, you know. It's going to be, yeah, it's basically going to be an overview of what am I looking for? And like, if I were approaching these papers, how, I'm not going to tell you like, these are the reasons to do, the, yeah, like I won't go into super detail, but I will be able to say like, I'm going to want it, I'm going to be looking for an intro paragraph. And in that intro paragraph, I'm generally going to want this, this, and this. If you don't stick to my instructions precisely, you can still do very well on the paper. It's just, these are general things that help your paper be clearer and easier to follow along with. And then I'll also give certain tips, like just to give an example, define all terms. Uh, this is another, like, I'll just give like a tip and say, very often I find myself writing this. What does that mean? Why is this something that I think is important? How will defining all your terms help you write your paper better? To what level of detail do you need to define your terms? And these are the ways in which philosophy papers are a bit different from other papers because, um, us philosophers are uh, pedantic pains in the ass and really care that your definitions are clear and really show that you understand this stuff. I'll also be talking about things I don't care about, like, um, like this is my favorite word to see in papers. Uh, I know you're told you're not supposed to use it, but in my class, I like that word a lot. Um, any other questions? Hopefully that responds to your question, Marco. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions before I uh, yeah, shut off the recording? Uh, I'm almost done with my paper already. Yeah. May I submit it uh, to you and can you give me a feedback? Yes, so here's the other thing. Let me write down this. I can't remember, did I put the, the date on the... So I don't have the paper prompt in front of me right now. So I don't remember the exact date on it. But here's the thing with papers. If you want feedback on a draft on your paper, the answer is yes. I'm very happy to give you feedback. As long as, um, you know what, let me just pull this up. So I actually have the, uh, I'm not giving you. So the thing says, as long as it's into me by Tuesday, the 23rd at 8 a.m. That's an eight. That's the worst date ever, but it's an eight. Uh, at 8 a.m., I will read over your draft and I'm willing to give, like basically what I'll do is I'll open it up in my computer, uh, either on my, my iPad and use like the little like stylus I have and mark it up and give feedback. It'll be in like tiny little font and red lettering, or I'll just do it in Microsoft Word and I will give you full feedback. I will send it back to you. You can then make corrections on it. And then if you want another round of feedback, I'm willing to do that as well. Basically, I am happy to read over as many papers as you need me to read over. Um, so yes, send it to me whenever. If you're done a draft already and want to get it to me, great, send it in. If you are done just a first paragraph and you're afraid to keep going until you've run it by me, feel free to send it to me. Anything that will help your writing process be better. Any other questions? Actually, one more question. Do you have an office hour? Wait, can you say that again? You cut out for a second. Do you have an, do you have an office hour? So do I officially have office hours? No, my office hours are whenever you want to meet with me. So reach out to me, be like, hey, can we meet up? Uh, and I will find a time and a Zoom link. So do I have set office hours? No, but, and this goes to everyone, anyone who wants to meet and talk face to face, I, AKA Zoom, um, just reach out to me and we'll find a time. I find if I set regular office hours, nobody comes to them and I just feel bad about myself. So instead I'd rather just meet at times that work best for everybody. But I, I mean like, and to be clear, like I'm very flexible. If I'm not teaching, I will have office hours with you. Weekends, fine. You know, what is a weekend anymore? Um, so yes, I'm happy to meet. Just shoot me an email and I will find a time we can both meet. 
Okay, thank you. I just have a reconstruction. That's why I, I'm, I, I'm not ready just to turn on my video or audio. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, any last questions? Yeah, what is your uh, feeling for citations regarding the material we used in your, in all of our class? I know it says if you use outside materials, make sure you cite. My citation policy on using uh, things for this class is, all right, you know what, I'm, um, pardon, I, I don't fucking care. I hate citations is the sh long and short of it. If it's something from class, I'll recognize it and I, uh, I'm fine with that. If you want to, so if you're somebody who has other professors who are sticklers for this and you want to include citations, like practice your Chicago style, feel free. But if it's something from this class that you're citing, the only thing I ask is if you are using a quote, put the page just so I know where to find it um, and make sure that like you, you're not taking it out of context or anything. Uh, but other than that, I really don't care. I really, there are many people out there who care about this stuff who will teach you how to do it properly. I, I do not care. So that's one last thing to worry about. Thank you. Yeah. Any last ones? All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to shut down the recording um, and I will bid you all.